Hello, everyone. My name is Rose Fickler. I'm the membership manager of the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our event today, our May Forum on Next Generation Mobility in Grand Rapids. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, the forum works with businesses and institutions to promote practices that advance climate leadership, community resilience, social justice, and the creation of a circular economy. I'd like to highlight a couple of upcoming events that the forum is hosting, um, including our professional headshot event later this week on May 14th with Bird and Bird Studios. There's only a couple of spots left. Um, so if you are interested, just head online uh, onto our website, onto our events calendar, and you can register for that. Um, it's from 4 to 7 p.m. and I, there's some spots available left between those times. We're also really looking forward to our June forum, which will be our very first in-person event of the year. Uh, the June event is focused on in-person networking and sustainable agriculture. We'll be abiding by current physical di distancing and COVID guidelines for the event. And more information about both events can be found on our website. And I'll put the link um, to that in the chat shortly. Videos of today's program and prior sessions are available on demand at no cost on West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum's YouTube channel. After this event, you're also going to receive an email with a link to today's event with a feedback survey and then any additional notes that come out of today's program. All of the uh, WMSBF programs are primarily funded through membership donations. If you are not yet a member of our organization, I'd encourage you to become one. And if you have any questions at all, I'd be happy to chat with you about it. On that note, I'd like to welcome uh, a couple of our new corporate members, Flatwater Farms and Irwin Seeding Company, and our new professional members, Andrea Johnson and Katie Venichek. Um, following this event, we are happy to welcome you to a virtual networking session in a separate breakout room to meet more of our members. And the link will be posted in the chat shortly, as well as at the end of the event. And that's directly after this event um, from 1 until 1.30. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists for our program today, Next Generation Mobility in West Michigan. Our speakers are Justin Kamura, the Assistant Mobile GR Director for the City of Grand Rapids, and Kendra Newsom, Customer Operations Manager for May Mobility, a company focused on transforming cities through autonomous technology. Thank you both so much for joining us today. For our attendees, please note that you can share thoughts with the panelists or all attendees throughout the chat function excuse me, through the chat function. You can also ask questions through the question and answer field and we'll have time at the end of the presentations for open question and answers. Justin, the screen is all yours to start us off. All right, thanks Rose. Let me go in and set myself up here. All right, I think everybody should be able to see that, okay. so. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me to participate in today's webinar. Uh, like Rose stated, my name is Justin Kimura, and I serve as the Assistant Mobile GR Director for the City of Grand Rapids. And today, I hope to share some information about our department, uh, provide some updates on two of our larger and recent initiatives, uh, the Autonomous Vehicle Pilot, uh, as was advertised here. And I'm also going to take the liberty to talk about our shared micromobility pilot, uh, i.e. the scooters, because if I don't talk about them, I think I'll get questions about it anyway. Um, and then I'll close out the, and give you a quick overview of some things we got coming up in Mobile GR. All right, so I'd like to first start with a quick overview of our department as we've had some restructuring in the past few years. So Mobile GR was formed in 2018 as a result of combining our legacy parking systems and traffic safety departments. And it now serves as our city's consolidated transportation and mobility department. Our department operates 35 parking lots and ramps throughout the city and manages more than 3,000 on street parking spaces. We conduct parking enforcement operations. We manage the dash shuttle. We maintain more than 200 city owned traffic signals, as well as an additional 500 signals owned by Michigan DOT, Kent County Road Commission, and surrounding cities and townships. We maintain more than 35,000 traffic and street signs, and we develop transportation and mobility policies and conduct multimodal traffic engineering assessments, designs, and improvement. In short, we provide safe, efficient, and equitable mobility options to ensure all residents and visitors have better ways to access jobs, services, and amenities. 
So like I said, before I get to the autonomous shuttle project, I'd like to first tell you about our ongoing shared micromobility project, more commonly known as the scooters. I'm sure most of you have seen the orange electric scooters around town in the past few months. And if you haven't had a chance to try them out yet, I really encourage you to do so. Uh, the pilot project is achieving one of the goals from our 2018 bike share study, which was to provide a point-to-point on-demand effective and affordable mobility system that provides first mile and last mile connections to other transit and mobility systems. A shared system such as this provides several benefits. It's eco-friendly as it is proven to reduce the amount of single passenger short car trips. These short trips, which are under two miles, account for about 35% of all car trips in the US and are a significant cause of congestion and climate change. The micromobility system helps us to promote, develop, and support multimodal corridors rather than those that are just catered for cars. This makes it safer for all non-car traffic, including bicycles and pedestrians. Micromobility puts people down on the street and gives them a positive view of the city while allowing riders to easily engage with local entities rather than driving right by them. Our system provides economic potential as shared micromobility systems such as these are a positive factor when the city is attracting conferences and other large scale events. Finally, as you know, during this time of COVID, micromobility has proven to be a safe, socially distant outdoor activity. All right, so since we launched the pilot with SPIN in September of last year, we've accumulated more than 98,000 rides, which in total, uh, which total almost 190,000 miles and more than 38,000 hours of usage. The average ride time has been about two miles and 25 minutes, which just about aligns with the problematic short car trips I mentioned earlier. Our biggest challenges to date have been improper parking of the scooters, sidewalk riding and underage riding, and we continue to work with SPIN to correct these efforts through education and outreach. The, the, like I said, right now, you know, besides education and outreach, we're also working with SPIN to provide some incentives uh, for good behavior, if you will. Um, and those can include being rewarded for property parking, proper parking jobs through ride credits or other types of incentives uh, that just encourage that good behavior. Um, the user agreements with these uh, also do allow for some fining and suspension of services, but we typically reserve those for the most egregious of violations. So, you know, I think you've all seen and, you know, we've got numerous complaints about, you know, these scooters on the sidewalks and everything else. So we're really focusing on that education and outreach. Uh, so in the coming weeks, Lime will also be joining our pilot program and bringing in their electric stand-up scooters as well as their new e-assist bicycles. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the core missions of Mobile GR is to provide equitable mobility options. So to achieve that, we partnered with SPIN to fund and develop a new community pass program from scratch. And that pass provides three months of free rides to those who might otherwise be unable to partake in these services. Uh, this free introduction to shared mobility can provide our residents with the means to run errands, to get to a job or a job interview, or just enjoy some safe outdoor recreation. So we launched this program last month and have partnered with five local organizations to distribute these passes completely at the city's expense in the hopes of introducing people to the service. And you know, if they see that it works for their daily lifestyle, um, then maybe they can incorporate it into their transit routine, you know, to augment or replace a bus pass, or you know, moving forward, a spin also off offers what they call a spin access program, which provides discounted rates to those who qualify under other federal, state, or local assistance programs. Uh, we're also working to provide similar passes to the Grow 1000 program this summer uh, for the participants that are 18 years or older, and to just be able to allow them to get to their summer jobs here under that program. As we bring Lyme into the system, Lyme does have a similar uh, uh, accessibility programs and Lyme is also looking to partner with the disability advocates of Kent County uh, to provide accessible vehicles for those that need them. 
All right, so moving on to our next project, which is kind of the meat of why we're here today, uh, the Grand Rapids Autonomous Vehicle Initiative, uh, otherwise known as ABGR. So I'm going to discuss why we as the city embarked on this project. And after I'm done, then Kendra will be discussing more of the operational and technology aspects of the program. So the ABGR pilot is a, a program that sought to bring electric, electric autonomous shuttles to downtown Grand Rapids. We commenced this program in July of 2019, and it was originally scheduled to last for just one year. But due to a suspension of service during the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated stay-at-home orders last year, we extended the pilot until this April. The pilot was originally a $650,000 public-private partnership between the city, May Mobility, and numerous sponsors, and the city's share, and this cost was $250,000. Uh, so we've utilized May Mobility's Polaris Gem uh, low-speed electric vehicles with a human field attendant, and we operated that on our existing uh, Dash West route um, alongside those shuttle buses. So some specs here, or some stats, I guess. The 3.2-mile fixed route consists of 20 stops, uh, 30 traffic signals, and 12 turns. So during the initial planning of this project, uh, we were fortunate to have early support and advocacy of city leadership and local stakeholders and didn't have to deal with much, if any, opposition to the project. So at a high level, this is what we embarked on as a city. Uh, this is why we embarked on this project as a city. Um, so we wanted to understand how autonomous mobility can operate in our world and how our world will adapt to autonomous mobility. Um, we wanted to assess the feasibility of this mobility option and identify barriers and benefits. You know, we wanted to ensure autonomous vehicle efforts could be equitable to all citizens and understand how AVs could affect mobility for the elderly as well as people with disabilities. We wanted to give our community Hey, Justin. Yep, can you see me okay? We can't, but now I can hear you. Okay, hold on. I, I think right. that our power just flashed here. And, uh, oh! <laughs> so I need mean, everything kind of reset on my screen and share everything again. I'm glad we still have you. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we've been working. So EOC had a, a couple of fuses blowing some of our distribution stations this morning. And I think they just repowered everything so that's why it's linked that's good yeah. all right oops okay can everybody see that the slideshow yep. okay looks good all right let me just uh, get my notes back up here All right, can you actually see the slides there? Okay. Uh, so where was I? Okay, so I was talking about, uh, you know, we wanted to provide this service for elderly people with disabilities. And we also wanted to give our community a sign of, you know, something uh, cool on the horizon that's coming and prepare the area for the effects of AV mobility. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that Mobile GR is also res uh, responsible for maintaining a lot of our traffic signals and traffic infrastructure. So we wanted to capture how autonomous vehicles uh, would interact with some of those infrastructure and see where we could prepare and modernize the infrastructure for future autonomous vehicles, whether it's a shuttle like this or just with private cars uh, getting some of this technology. Um, so working with May Mobility, you know, we were also interested in seeing or in advancing AV technology itself, as well as seeing how these vehicles could work in the full four seasons of Michigan. Uh, so moving forward, you know, I said I'll let Kendra talk about some of the, the operational and the technological details about the vehicles and the routes. Um, 
But some good news, we recently approved, obtained approval from the city commission to continue the project for another year. And we're looking to push the project into some of the west side neighborhoods of focus and shift into a new curb on demand system. Um, so beyond continuing to learn about the autonomous vehicle systems, these changes will hopefully provide the city with some information on those mobility requirements in the area, as well as the curb on demand system in general that can help us to inform future services. So this is my last slide here. So like I said, just before I hand this off to Kendra, I just quickly wanted to close by sharing some of Mobile GR's upcoming initiatives. On this upcoming fiscal year, you know, talking about our equity priorities. So we intend to start developing a transportation framework that will assist residents of our underserved neighborhoods in, in accessing suitable transportation for getting to employment. Uh, potential solutions could range from you know, low cost transit access passes to a car share system, uh, but our solutions will be informed by outreach and engagement with the residents in those areas. We continue to implement our Vision Zero guidelines this year, specifically revamping our traffic calming program to take a holistic and proactive look at areas prone to drive to bad driving habits rather than reacting to citizen complaints. We're now collecting our residential and commercial district on street parking usage data on a routine basis, which will help us to develop trends that can influence more appropriate and accurate parking control measures. Uh, one of the big things we've got going on is during COVID, we were forced to quickly react and adapt to changing needs in our curbs, uh, which curb, for those of you unaware, curb management, you know, curbs are some of the most valuable real estate in a city like this. Um, so our businesses, you know, during COVID needed to shift their business models and they needed more curbside pickup areas rather than on-street parking. So we're looking to build upon those lessons and refine how we manage that valuable curb area. And we continue to work with the RAPID um, as we recently signed a new maintenance agreement to improve bus stop cleanliness and are looking to partner and invest in more shelters and bus stop infrastructure. So a lot going on in the coming months and year. And you know, we're looking forward to implementing our initiatives and helping the city to recover and continue to move forward. And I think with that, I will hand it off back to Rose and I'll be uh, more than happy to answer any questions at the end there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that overview. It's very, uh, very beneficial. Um, Kendra, if you want to take it away and give us a little bit more details about the May Mobility Project and and uh, and all of your projects, that'd be fantastic. Sure. Thank you, Rose. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me pull up my screen here. Okay. Can everyone see that? Looks good. Okay. So uh, thanks again. Uh, my name is Kendra Newsom, and I work for uh, May Mobility. I'm the customer operations manager. So uh, my role is to oversee all of our US operations. Uh, previous to this role, I was the uh, site manager for the AVGR pilot and managed the majority of the first year. Um, I do live in Grand Rapids and have for over 15 years, um, even though we are not based in Grand Rapids. So I wanted to just take a few minutes and give a quick overview of who May Mobility is. Um, if you haven't seen us um, or heard of us, um, we are an, uh, an Ann Arbor based startup and we are celebrating our fourth birthday on Monday the 17th. Uh, we do focus on autonomous uh, technology and we also operate it as well. Um, currently we have over 150 employees from engineers uh, to operations. So uh, our vision at May Mobility is to transform cities through self-driving technology and to create a safer, greener, and more accessible world. And how we do that is by operating fleets of autonomous shuttles. Um, and we run our own self-driving software for central business districts, enterprise campuses, and residential communities. So in addition to creating, designing, and implementing the technology, we operate it in the field as well. Um, there are three main components to our services at May Mobility. So the first, in addition to our technology, is our route development. 
uh, May engineers work very closely with our customers and the community members to identify um, and develop routes within the community that meet the specific needs of our riders and our customers. Uh, we offer this as a turnkey service. So we design and implement and maintain our fleet of shuttles. We train and deploy May employed fleet attendants. Um, those are the safety drivers and vehicle um, for outstanding rider experience. And we provide a constant feedback loop for our customers. The third pillar of our service is our data. Our, our vehicles are collecting a large amount of data all day that they're on the road, and we are constantly collecting that data, analyzing it for improvement, and also sharing it with our partners so that we can help plan development and traffic flow in any uh, city infrastructure for the future and help uh, prioritize investments with our partners. Uh, more than our innovative technology, we offer improved access and mobility. So May's service increases mobility, connects riders to other modes of transportation, including wheelchair accessible vehicles, to ensure we're meeting the needs of all of our community members. Um, we provide equitable transit by filling service gaps in focused neighborhoods and transportation deserts. We look to reduce congestion and emissions with our shared electric and hybrid platforms, maze vehicles are an efficient and sustainable way to move. We reduce demand on infrastructure. So our shared platforms make the first and last mile connections um, that ease parking issues that many of our communities face. We create jobs in every city that we deploy. We open an office and we hire local team members to manage the service like myself, um, as well as all of our safety drivers, bringing anywhere from 20 to 25 um, current uh, employees to a site and, and scaling beyond that. And again, data, we gather a ton of data, we analyze it, um, where our riders are coming from, where they're going, traffic flows and any infrastructure needs for the future of the city. Currently, um, we have launched pilots in six cities and we have two additional routes coming in the next six months. Uh, previous to COVID, we had sites operating in Detroit, Michigan. That's our longest um, and our oldest launch. Um, Columbus, Ohio and Providence, Rhode Island. Current operation in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, a new launch uh, in March of this year in Arlington, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. Um, also in March, a new operation in Higashi, Hiroshima, Japan, which is our first international um, site. And uh, coming at the end of this month, we will have a new site in Indianapolis, Indiana. There are a few phases of our commercial application. So the first phase is uh, taking our autonomous uh, technology kit, our autonomous driving technology, and integrating it into the electric Polaris Gem platform. Those are the vehicles that uh, Justin talked about and what has been operating in Grand Rapids for the past year. Um, we were able to integrate our technology into this platform. The Gem was a great tool for May to get off the ground um, and integrate our, our technology and our self-driving um, capabilities and to prove self-driving te technology in a limited operational design domain. So we, we stick to, to low speeds, um, about 25 mile per hour roads uh, within certain target markets. Um, the next phase is to take that technology and integrate it into an automotive grade platform. So our next step is to look at something beyond the Polaris gem, um, specifically currently an Alexis um, SUV type vehicle. Um, so we take our technology, implement it into an automotive grade platform, and then ex that allows us to expand our design domain. And that means we can operate in a larger variety of situations um, and target new markets. And then um, also, as Justin mentioned, we are implementing a new on-demand service. Uh, we are currently uh, deploying an on-demand service in Texas, and we're looking to start that here in July in Grand Rapids. Uh, the next phase would be to scale that deployment. So taking our technology and instead integrating it into a platform that is purposefully and intentionally built for mobility as a service. Uh, currently, there are not very many, if any, of these platforms available. 
Um, so we're looking forward to that in the future. Um, May does not build vehicles. We just build the technology and integrate it into um, something that is provided by another manufacturer. Um, and our second thing in phase three is to integrate our teleassist technology. This is something May has been working on, um, testing behind the scenes and hoping to deployment in production, deploy it in production soon um, by the end of this year. Uh, this is a feature that allows us to integrate with our um, and engage with our vehicles on route from a remote location. So we can assist the vehicle in making policy decisions in real time. Um, and this would allow us to, in the future, move past safety drivers and have a truly uh, driverless deployment in the future. And the, the fourth phase of this is to prove our, our self-driving and to be capable in all of our target markets and expand our operational domain um, and create a network effect of overlapping service areas um, within a community um, so that we aren't just providing um, independent uh, routes here and there that but that we are networking together and working with other modes of transportation throughout the city. So we have a couple of uh, current use cases. Um, historically, our use case has been first and last mile fixed route uh, um, connections. So we connect to other modes of transit, uh, classrooms, economic and entertainment hubs. We move a lot of students and um, pre-COVID, a lot of commuters. Um, this is what has been in Grand Rapids for the pilot year and in our previous routes. Um, our most recent use case is an on-demand service. So this is a dynamic and flexible service that can move riders between any combination of pre-selected locations within a larger service area. This allows us to be more efficient, riders to get where they're going a little bit faster. Um, and we look forward to implementing that here in Grand Rapids um, in July of this year. So something exciting for the future is expanding our platform offerings. So as I said, we have um, historically operated with the Polaris electric gem. Um, many people know it as a very fancy golf cart. Um, that's the top left corner. And you've probably seen that out on the roads in Grand Rapids. Um, currently, um, as of Monday, we are moving into the Lexus RX 450 hybrid vehicle. That's the second pictured there. We currently operate it in Arlington, Texas, and we'll be also deploying it in Indianapolis at the end of this month. Um, beyond that, we have uh, several vehicles and platforms we're working on behind the scenes and we'll be announcing at some point, but we have a Toyota platform coming out um, at the end of this year in a larger capacity. And beyond that, we have um, true electric vehicle platforms as our end goal um, beyond, as we talk about automotive grade vehicles, but fully electric. Um, so our autonomous driving kit is something that we can deploy on um, all of these platforms at this time and look forward to expanding our platforms as we move forward in the future. And what makes us different is our unique approach to autonomy. So we have a unique multi-policy decision-making behavior um, that allows our vehicles to sort of assess the environment around them and then we give them the tools to react to different situations in real time. Uh, as I said, we integrate our technology seamlessly into a variety of platforms uh, in the future, allowing us to customize our fleet based on the needs of the community we are serving. Uh, and we bridge that first and last mile gap. So unlike traditional ride sharing, um, like a Lyft or an Uber, uh, we are not looking to be robo taxis. Um, our service is designed to work alongside and integrate into um, existing transportation systems. We want to bridge that first and last mile gap and provide additional mobility and accessibility. Uh, so in addition to just an overview of May, I want to talk about some highlights of our first year in Grand Rapids. So all of our services operate on three main objectives in a very specific order. So above everything else, safety is our top priority. All of our decisions are made on uh, based on safety and our safety drivers are empowered to take over and drive a vehicle manually if there are any safety concerns ever. And that's why a fleet attendant is currently always in a shuttle in all operations. Um, our second value um, in our service is rider experience. We are not just a company that makes an autonomous vehicle product. We operate it and we are 
really a transportation company. So we're very focused on our rider experience. Um, we wanna make sure that yes, our short times, our, our wait times are short and we have a friendly face inside the vehicle, but um, we wanna make sure that the ride is smooth and that the entire experience for the rider is enjoyable. And after all of that is our autonomy. So we are an autonomous vehicle company, but we only prioritize autonomy after safety and rider experience come first. Um, some of the components of our, our service are operations. Um, so here in Grand Rapids, we have four full-time staff members, um, a site manager, some supervisors, and a technician, as well as 15 to 20 safety drivers, all of who are our local um, community members. Um, we maintain our vehicles in-house and are currently working with um, a local dealership as well to help us maintain our vehicles. And again, um, providing a lot of uh, data reporting and customer service to our customers. So some statistics and highlights about the first year, we moved um, over 80,000 riders. We drove over 37,000 miles. And in August of 2020, after a, a brief um, service shutdown for the beginning of the pandemic, we returned with something that we call clean shuttle, which is um, brand new technology that isn't being done in other applications. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, Justin went over some of this, but a, a 3.2 mile fixed autonomous route, um, 20 stops over 30 traffic lights, a lot of um, complicated turns. This was um, at the time our most complicated route um, that we had operated on. Um, and throughout the life of the deployment, we had several construction zones, um, a lot of uh, new changes to our route with uh, social spaces due to the pandemic. And we learned a lot throughout this year, um, both before and during the COVID pandemic. Um, we connected a lot of parking lots as well in the downtown area. So really quickly, um, four GEM Polaris vehicles on route at all times, plus one wheelchair accessible um, Polaris uh, that we deployed in December um, for a total of nine shuttles on hand, um, four on route at all times and the on-demand wheelchair vehicle. Um, our maximum speed and autonomy is currently 22 miles per hour. And uh, again, a vehicle operator is present at all times. Um, and the clean shuttle, we added partitions, um, some UVC sanitizing and hydrogen peroxide fogging. Uh, at the time before the pandemic, we were moving over 500 riders a day on average. Uh, many students from Kendall and GVSU, a lot of commuters going back and forth to work and um, to the courtroom and a lot of different locations around town. Um, after we returned with clean shuttle, we were about 125 riders a day, um, steadily increasing um, as we come back to some changes post um, pandemic. Our net promoter score has been over 90 um, with a lot of feedback about safety and reliability, friendly drivers, comfortable ride. Um, and we did find through our surveys that 23% of our riders had never used public transit service before. And 24% of our riders tried additional forms of transportation after using the May service. So sometimes, um, the autonomous vehicle kind of captures people's attention and they come and give it a ride and we were able to allow people to um, experience the dash bus and, and other transportation that they were unaware of previously. Uh, some other learnings from the first year, we learned and adapted to a challenging downtown environment, a lot of heavy precipitation this winter, um, some uh, challenging traffic patterns um, and construction, lane changes. Um, we found that the weekdays were a much more popular service. We started with Saturdays and eventually landed on Monday through Friday, seven to seven, with the bulk of our ridership being um, commuters and students. Uh, some positive experiences with our wheelchair accessible vehicle, um, are still developing a relationship with the existing public transit agencies. And again, first time transportation users um, and overall good reception to the clean shuttle um, initiative. On the right, a little bit difficult to see in this presentation, but just uh, quickly, this is an autonomous heat map 
which means um, the, the more warm the color, so red is good, um, that means we are driving in autonomy. Um, blue is where we are driving more uh, manually, uh, the driver is driving. So on the top is at the beginning of our uh, launch and at the bottom is near the end of our first year pilot. So as you can see, we drastically improved um, the amount of time we were in autonomy versus when we were driving as we learned. Um, quick, uh, some facts on the clean shuttle if you haven't seen it. So we have a physical partition that separates the driver from the rider. We worked with a company in Grand Haven on a UVC light treatment, and we sanitize our entire cabin between each rider. It takes about three minutes, um, and this sanitizes our surfaces. Uh, at the end of each shift, we use um, a hydrogen peroxide hospital grade fogging system to fog the entire vehicle and that is safe for our electronics and also um, kills everything we're trying to, to kill inside the vehicle. Um, and we also improved our HVAC filters increasing to a MERV, for, a MERV 13 um, as well as adding some hand sanitizer for our riders on board. Um, so what does it look like for a year two? As Justin mentioned, we're moving into year two soon. Um, starting on Monday, you may see us on the road today um, doing some testing, but we are pivoting to our new platform, which is a, a hybrid vehicle. Um, the max speed we actually drive it manually is about 40 miles per hour, um, but in autonomy, we uh, stay at 22 miles per hour. All of the roads that we drive on are 25 miles per hour limit. Again, always a fleet attendant present. Um, the vehicle right now currently for the Lexus is uh, a gas electric hybrid um, and our technology uses a separate electric power source. And then our wheelchair vehicle for now will remain the GEM. Um, it is a fully electric vehicle, again, 22 mile per hour autonomy and a fleet attendant. Our, our technology uses the same power source in this case. Um, and as we move forward, we'll look to add a new platform, um, an automotive grade platform for our wheelchair accessible vehicle as well. Uh, in addition to the new platform, we will have a new service area sometime uh, this summer, uh, targeted around July. Um, a little difficult to see on this map, but for those of you that know that we've been on the Dash West, our new route will connect a similar area to uh, more neighborhood areas in the West. So we will connect the Monroe uh, transportation hub near DeVos and, and cross over to the West, cross the river and maintain our presence near Bridge Street Market on the West side. And then we will continue down Bridge Street up into a more residential area. And this allows us to reach some residents that don't currently have as much access to public transportation and get them back downtown um, across the river. Uh, also coming this summer um, with our new service, we'll be launching the on-demand application as we talked about. So uh, this is a partnership with a company called Via, a large rideshare uh, business in the US. And we'll partner with them to offer a point to point on demand service. Um, this means that we have pre-programmed stops, but we don't continue in a loop like a, a, a bus route that we have been um, historically. So we will be able to move more quickly between stops, get riders uh, where they need to go more efficiently. And also this allows us to add an app um, this is uh, something that riders have been asking for. They can see availability, see where shuttles are and see where they're going. It also allows us to um, solicit more dynamic feedback from our riders. We will still continue to have ways for riders to ride with us if they don't have an app. So um, calling a phone number um, and things like that. Uh, beyond our year two, um, with AVGR. Uh, we are in um, very initial conversations for a potential route on the east side. So talking with Beacon Hill and Uptown GR, Amplify GR, um, just looking to see what some needs are for the community on that side. This is a completely separate route from from AVGR and from mobile GR in the city, but this is just something else um, that we are currently talking about and, and looking into. Um, this would uh, connect residents of Beacon Hill um, and, and local food and uh, shops, as well as um, healthcare. And so we are just in the initial conversations uh, of this um, opportunity on the east side. So when we talk about uh, engagement and education as, as our last um, pillar of May, and so 
there are a lot of stakeholders interested in the impacts of autonomous uh, vehicles. We know it's uh, it's a hot topic and it's definitely something important to our future. So we wanna work to increase the knowledge and build trust in this um, technology. Talking to police departments, fire departments, uh, public works and other transit agencies. In addition to the local um, agencies, we also work very closely with the American Public Transportation Association and specifically PAVE, which is um, an education um, outreach program focused specifically on automated uh, vehicles. Uh, and so what we do when we are launching in any community is to talk to the community. We really want to be engaged and make sure that we are providing a service that's beneficial to everyone. So we identify key community stakeholders. We work with our partners to establish a shared message and goal. We schedule events and milestones to check in and look at progress. Some things we've done in Grand Rapids specifically, neighborhood town halls and accessibility workshop. Uh, rider surveys, first responder walkthrough, and have worked with some local businesses on proof of concepts in our vehicles. We recently added a marketing team in the last year, and we focus on garnering attention for our new service launches. Uh, we work with our, our partners to establish local messaging and um, create promotional content uh, for riders and customers alike. And uh, lastly, at May, we're always looking for how we can engage with um, those of you in the communities we serve and, and other local partners. So if you'd like to get involved, um, you can help promote our service and our routes um, so that we can deliver the maximum benefit. If you're interested in providing sponsorship to maintain and expand any service in West Michigan, please um, feel free to reach out, give us feedback and tell us how we can do better and, and better serve this community. And if nothing else, take a ride with us. So starting on Monday at 7 a.m., you can get into a new Lexus vehicle and uh, let us know how we're doing. So um, I know that was a lot, but <laughs> thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Rose. Excellent. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, that is, it was wonderful, um, both of you. Uh, we are going to uh, turn it over to question and answers now. I'd like to introduce my, um, my colleague, Daniel Schoonmaker. He's the executive director for the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. Um, and he is going to handle all of the question and answers for you. Hi, thank you so much, Rose. Thank you, and thank you again, Kendra and Justin, uh, Justin, uh, Justin for sharing your work with us today. Uh, so I'm going to walk through, walk 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 through the through the uh, through questions and answers. If uh, uh, if you have any that you haven't shared yet, please use the Q and A function uh, that you can find on the middle of the bottom of your screen, or just drop those into the chat. Uh, and when we get started off, I'd, I'd like to ask a question of my own, uh, uh, Kendra and Justin. Uh, can you share a little bit about how uh, how you're hopeful that uh, autonomous vehicles can help improve the sustainability of the transportation system locally or in general? Uh, and I think I would kind of measure that by uh, greenhouse gas emissions, congestion, uh, social equity. Any thoughts uh, thoughts therein that might expand on uh, what we would have shared in the presentation already? I guess I can start, and at least from the city's perspective, you know, this it's another transit option within our city. And you know, anytime we can offer a you know an accessible and an equitable transit option, you know, regardless of what the platform is, that transit option, you know, should help to reduce congestion. You know, as I talked about, you know. You know, with my with the scooter example, for example, I mean, you know, you wouldn't really view that as a transit option, but you know, people are using those to get to jobs and you know, run errands and stuff. And you know, we're we're hopeful and we're trying to find that that's reducing. You know, the, the data we get from that correlates with you know, single the short single user uh, short rides. You know, such as the, you would use a personal car for or a taxi. So we're hoping that just having that transit option, you know, will help to reduce congestion and start to get some of those single user vehicles off the road. Um, you know, I think maybe from Kendra's standpoint, you know, and, and to target that question is not so much the autonomy as well. I mean, maybe there are autonomy benefits, but the fact that they're, you know, main mobility is such a big advocate of, you know, uh, electric vehicles and that's what's in their future. I mean, that helps us as well. 
Yeah, I think definitely uh, looking at the platforms that we hope to provide in the future. So from an autonomy standpoint, our focus is on safety. So, you know, 90, I think most recently it's 94% of accidents are, are due to, you know, drivers. So, and, and human error. So autonomous is a safety, autonomy is a safety focus, but as far as um, sustainability, I, I saw some questions in the chat about um, a hybrid vehicle over an electric. So, you know, the Lexus, I think I mentioned, is a short-term um, option for our platform. We just wanted to move forward into an automotive grade vehicle and prove our capability in that realm. Um, the reason we don't have a fully electric uh, rideshare vehicle now is just um, the availability of that type of platform. It isn't something that is um, widely commercially available. So that's why we have the hybrid for now and are looking to move to a fully electric in the future. Okay, All right, thank you both. Uh, Justin, this will be specific to you, and I, I, I don't think this is I think this is uh, uh, this question was intended to to necessarily be be material to the main mobility uh, pilot. Uh, but is, has the city evaluated any alternative car, car share scenario similar to Zipcar as part of its uh, transportation portfolio? So there, there's some aspect to that. So I talked about our new neighborhood of focus, you know, transportation demand management, you know, where we look in you know, over the next year, we hope to start getting, you know, developing what the requirement is for some of those residents and those the areas that are currently underserved and how we can help to provide, you know, more options, transportation options for them to get to places of employment. So car share is just one of the options we're considering. You know, another option could just be, you know, working with local transit providers to provide, you know, a kind of an all-in-one transit pass, if you will, that could be affordable and, you know, have some uh, accessibility uh, aspects there. So, you know, I use analogy, you know, I visited, you know, in my previous job, visited several cities overseas. And, you know, if you go to like France, for example, you know, you buy with this one little transit card and it's like, I think it was 20 euros for a whole week, which is not much. And that, you know, that paid for the, the regional commuter train, the metro, as well as the bus system. And so that card, you know, you could just pay that one fee for the whole week and it would work across the board. Um, so that's an example of, you know, what's, you know, what's in the realm of possible, but, you know, car share is just one option. Um, and then I saw Matthew's question in there on whether it would be a city owned system or if we work with a local vendor. Um, I think it's a little premature to make that determination. The first thing is to develop the need. Um, but, you know, just as a, maybe as a potential parallel there, you know, with the scooter program, our, our bike share feasibility study called for it to be a city owned nonprofit operated system and from just in that time from 2018 until when we started the pilot last year that industry has changed so much that we decided to pursue more of a hybrid option where it's a city managed system and we're working with a commercial vendor and so in that scooter pilot that we have ongoing right now the city has not spent a dime on any of the operations or maintenance costs that's all been on the vendor and you know, there's a lot, when you start a project like that as a city, there's a lot of capital startup for overhead, for purchasing the vehicles, and then for maintaining and recapitalizing the vehicles as you move on. Um, so we find it was more beneficial to let the vendor take care of that. And we've been able to focus all of the city efforts on building the infrastructure to support that program, as well as on equity and safety programs. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Kendra, I think you, you, this question came before you, you had a slide that uh, covered this a little bit with some of your future expansion plans. Uh, but can you share a little further about, uh, uh, about potentially of, uh, of expanding to areas outside the city, city like the township, Kentwood, uh, Wyoming, Beltline even? Sure. Um, so for our pilot, we are specifically working with with Mobile GR, and for our um, year two, looking at neighborhoods of focus that have been identified um, for the city of Grand Rapids. Um, separately from that, we are open to looking at our opportunities outside of that, in addition um, to the current AVGR service. So uh, the one that I mentioned um, is one we are in conversation with right now. That's specifically the east side. Um, and is just uh, something that has come up 
based on um, interested parties. So definitely open to other areas. I know um, myself have looked um, at some opportunities in Wyoming specifically. Um, I think our business development team, some of them, a couple might be on uh, here in the next group. Um, also Rose will be giving out contact information. So we're happy to look into those other needs around the community, but we love partnering with West Michigan. Again, I said I live here. We're looking forward to expanding things beyond just the current route. Uh, Justin, the, uh, this is a follow-up question based on that. The, uh, uh, outside of the work that kind of happens through the rapid, can you share what, uh, uh, what, what level of uh, collaboration and dialogue ha is happening between uh, Grand Rapids and its neighbor cities like EGR, Wyoming, uh, Wyoming, Kentwood, uh, for some of these uh, uh, the, 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 these uh, uh, next generation mobility investments. Uh, I think at this point it's probably been a little late. You know, we do talk with our partners, and you know, we share some best practices and lessons learned. Um, but right now, each is kind of venturing, you know, on these options on their own. Um, but we're starting to get better, I think, at that. So, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to scooters, but, you know, this is why I brought them up in the beginning, because I know questions kind of go back there. But, you know, mm -hmm. Calvin, uh, Calvin University has recently uh, partnered with SPIN to bring them there. And, you know, it, right now they've decided to keep them just on campus. But, as you know, Calvin University is kind of right in the border there between Grand Rapids and East Grand Rapids, and I think even Kent Wood. So, you know, we've already had some of those early discussions on how we can partner with them to, you know, to bring that service outside the camp, you know, the Calvin campus, or, you know, as we look forward beyond the pilot, you know, right now our pilot's only covering about a third of the city. So if we make that city wide, then, you know, there definitely have to be some discussions on those border areas there. But, you know, I think in general, we, you know, we, we'd love to work with those partners and we do see them, you know, both, you know, working through the rapid as a regional transit provider and, how can we also expand that partnership to make sure some of our initiatives are aligned? Kendra, a question for you. How is May working with the, uh, uh, with the car companies? So uh, we are currently working um, with Toyota. So our, our Lexus platform is a, something we're working on with Toyota. And then I think I mentioned our, our next platform we're in testing with right now is, is a Toyota platform as well. Um, so we partner pretty closely with them um, and looking at another major company after that um, in addition. So um, not Tesla. Um, Tesla is, pri is pri proprietary. Um, I think maybe a part of this question is about the technology as well. So just to clarify, so May, we create our own technology from the ground up, uh, software and hardware, and then we integrate it into vehicles. So um, Tesla also creates their own technology. So we don't work with anyone like Tesla. Um, everyone is in-house. All of our engineers are in-house. Our CEO is a robotics engineer and professor um, from U of M. So everything is done um, within May, and then we sort of take that technology and, and drop it into a vehicle. And the uh, and, and this 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 be a good opportunity for this question. Uh, can can you explain the the, the thought process and uh, moving to the uh, moving into the hybrid vehicles? Yeah, again, um, so we wanted to move into an automotive grade vehicle. So the, the Polaris gem was a fantastic way for us to get off the ground and to prove our technology um, and to learn um, about our riders and, and what the needs are for communities, but it's not a long-term option. Um, these vehicles, they're not intended for um, the snow we get in, in West Michigan. They're not intended for the amount of just the amount of wear and tear and the mileage we put on them. So they were fantastic. They are fantastic, um, but it's not something um, that's a long-term option. So the Lexus again is a short-term option as a hybrid to get us into an automotive grade vehicle as we work with um, the large US um, companies to find that next generation, which would be a fully electric, but ride share platform vehicle. There just aren't, a lot of fully electric, you know, many passenger vehicles out there. 
As 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 a follow-up question for both of you, and I, I think this would be for Kent more for mobility, and Justin, this would be for uh, likely likely to include the scooters and mobile mobility. Uh, are are you? Uh, you've suggested that these are being used as an active commuting option, so people taking them to work and uh, kind of a professional type destinations, as opposed to uh, leisure and curiosity. Uh, do you, like to the to what extent are you are are you seeing those applications currently? Um, so I can talk a little bit about that. I guess um, so. When we first started, we wanted to see all of our use cases and who was riding. And over time, and through surveys, we found out. And also anecdotally, we do have rider uh, drivers in them. Um, so uh, we know that the majority of our riders pre-pandemic were students and commuters. Um, that doesn't mean we didn't have people for entertainment, but just a large majority of them were regular riders every day. Um, we did find that we didn't have as much need um, for a Saturday service as we did for five days a week service. So it was more of the people looking for a regular um, daily repeatable commute. Um, also our service hours ending at 7 p.m. Um, we didn't you know, have as much of the, the nightlife service as we did just the, the daily commuters. I think to, you know, to add on to that, you know, if you asked them about that with the scooters. So, you know, right now I would say, you know, the majority of our rides are still recreational. So we continue to push this as a transit option. Um, but I think part of that is because, you know, our data is a little skewed there just because, you know, the scooters are available 24 seven right now. And if you're ever downtown on a busy Friday or Saturday night, I mean, you see that there being, there's tons of them out there. You know, I think, We've got some reports that, that the Griffin team over the weekend that night, the scooters were just, you know, being used very heavily there. So, you know, I think, you know, because we, we do offer that 24 seven service that, you know, that that, that is gonna, you know, trend that way towards, you know, non community uses a little bit. Um, and, you know, we're also trying to analyze, you know, as people start to come back in, into the downtown area or, you know, return to offices versus working at home, you know, how that shift um, may come. Uh, we are working with spin to they are able to uh, you know to start providing us with some some trends and some heat maps of the this uh origin and destination for each individual ride and we do see we are seeing some trends on you know pretty common routes and you know ironically you know i talked about how you know we're you know one of our big challenges has been improper parking um, and it's not so much hazardous parking but they're just outside of those designated zones that we've set up but they're still parked in a safe area and you know so we are just anecdotally seeing you know where we see this you know same amount of scooters parked I parked outside of you know ex businesses you know during work hours every day and you know and then they disappear at the end of the day so that's you know that kind of anecdote tells us somebody is riding a scooter to that place of employment and then departing on it in the afternoon so you know using some of that trends and data you know we're also looking at ways we can adapt our parking infrastructure as well to facilitate that use well, thank you so much, Kendra and Justin, and appreciate your time today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to Rose uh, to, uh, to, Ro uh, to Rose here to wrap uh, to, to wrap up our uh, our uh, our forum this uh, this month. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate everybody um, being here today. Uh, and if you would, um, we hope that you're going to um, join us for our upcoming West Michigan Steel Business Forum meeting in June, which again is our first in-person networking forum of 2021. And you can uh, register for the event online. Um, if you'd like to participate in our networking portion of the event, please join us in our networking meeting. The link has been posted in the chat. We'll be in there from 1 to 1.30 or from now until 1.30. Um, and if you found our talk valuable today, please consider becoming a member or checking out our website for our upcoming events and other opportunities. Thank you all so much again for joining us. And we hope that you have a wonderful um, rest of your day and rest of your week. We'll send out the recording and the receipt for this as well. Thank you, Kendra. And thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks again, Justin. Thanks again, Kendra. Thanks. Bye.